On the evening of January 31st, 2019, a Thursday, Libby Squire, aged 21 and a philosophy student at a university in East Yorkshire, England, reluctantly accompanied her friends for a night out in her hometown. Despite an early morning lecture looming the next day, she didn't want to let her friends down. Libby resided in shared housing near the university. Throughout the evening, she stayed connected with her boyfriend, James Pye. The final message he received from her was at 10.30 p.m. Concerns arose on February 1st when James, along with Libby's friends and family, attempted to contact her but were unsuccessful. They went to her residence, only to discover she was not present. After speaking with Libby's friends, law enforcement learned that she did not leave the club with them that night. According to her friends, Libby was denied entry to the Welly nightclub and hall because she appeared to be too intoxicated. Concerned for her well-being, they arranged for a cab to take her back to her residence on Wellesley Avenue. Police conducted a thorough search of the area, resulting in the discovery of Libby's house keys in a neighboring garden. CCTV footage was gathered from nearby locations, and multiple witnesses were interviewed as part of the investigation. These efforts revealed that Libby did arrive home in the cab, but instead of entering her house, she chose to walk down the street. Based on the information gathered from CCTV footage and witness testimonies, law enforcement focused on a specific lead in Libby's disappearance, strongly believing they had identified the individual responsible. Despite the identification of the person involved, Libby's whereabouts remained shrouded in mystery. It took seven weeks after her initial disappearance for her body to be discovered in the Humber Estuary, situated between Spurn Point and Grimsby. Pavorella, a 26-year-old man who had been questioned shortly after Libby went missing, was arrested in connection with her death. Originally from Poland, Rella lived in Hull with his wife and two young children and worked as a butcher for Carol Foods in Milton, North Yorkshire. During police questioning, Rella claimed that he had encountered Libby in distress on the street and offered her a ride home. He insisted that he dropped her off near some playing fields because she was feeling unwell, maintaining that it was the last time he saw her. Despite asserting his innocence, Rella urged the police to review surveillance footage, stating, I have nothing to hide. After an extensive investigation, Rella was charged with rape and murder. Despite pleading not guilty, the prosecution argued that Libby returned home that fateful night in an extremely vulnerable state. The weather was harshly cold, and Libby, alone and intoxicated, accidentally dropped her house keys in a neighbor's garden. The prosecutor emphasized to the court that Libby likely suffered from hypothermia and immense distress. Without her house keys, she found herself in tears, repeatedly collapsing as she struggled to find her way home. When questioned about the bag, Powell initially claimed ignorance, later stating he had forgotten about it and didn't know its origin or how long it had been there. In the year leading up to Libby's disappearance, Powell had engaged in disturbing behavior, including exposing himself to women in public and peering into windows, as evidenced in court. The jury learned that a female student had a frightening encounter when she spotted a man's face peering into her window as she was dressing. The man's proximity to the window caused her significant fear, and she identified the individual as Powell. Another woman reported seeing Powell at her window while she was having an intimate moment with her boyfriend. Later that night, her housemates discovered a used contraceptive hanging on the front door and women's underwear in the letterbox. Additionally, another victim found an unwrapped contraceptive and a pair of women's underwear beside her child's toy. During the trial, forensic scientist Nicola Taylor testified that Powell's DNA and bodily fluid were detected on the women's underwear, providing further incriminating evidence against him. During her testimony, she indicated to the jury that this discovery suggested intimate contact with the underwear, possibly indicating that Powell had warned them. According to the prosecution's case presented in court, Libby entered Rella's car after midnight and was driven to the Oak Road playing fields. Although CCTV footage captured Libby getting into the car, no further footage was available after she arrived at the playing fields. 
The prosecution argued that Rella then sexually assaulted Libby and placed her, either deceased or dying, into the cold waters of the river hull. They believed that Libby's body subsequently drifted out to sea from that location. To support their argument that Libby was sexually assaulted at the playing fields, the prosecution called Sam as a witness. Sam, who lived nearby the playing fields, testified that he heard a woman's desperate screams coming from the direction of the river. According to court proceedings, a man was later observed emerging from the darkness and fleeing the scene. The prosecution asserted that they believed the woman screaming was Libby, and the man seen running away was Powell. Significantly, Libby was not captured on any additional CCTV footage after leaving the playing fields. The prosecution further argued that Pavel had visible scratches on his face, alleging that Libby had inflicted them as she fought for her life. Summarizing their case, the prosecution conveyed to the jury that the evidence supported the conclusion that Libby was raped by a man whose sole motivation for encountering her that night was to take her away from safety to a remote area known to him, where he subjected her to his uncontrollable sexual urges. During the trial, the prosecution faced challenges in determining the exact cause of Libby's death. Dr. Matthew Lyle, the medical examiner, testified that the cause of Libby's death couldn't be conclusively ascertained. Her body had been submerged in water for nearly two months, making it impossible to determine whether she was alive or deceased when she entered the water due to decomposition. Notably, an evident bruise was observed on the inside of her right thigh. Upon further examination, it was revealed that Libby had lacerations inside her upper lip, indicating she may have suffered blunt force trauma. Additionally, small hemorrhages around her mouth suggested the possibility of neck compression or mouth covering. However, it was noted that these injuries could have occurred either while she was in the water or shortly before her death. Dr. Lyle also suggested there could be additional injuries on her body that were not immediately visible. Throughout the court proceedings, testimony explored three potential causes of Libby's death, hypothermia, drowning, and asphyxia. Dr. Lyle explained that hypothermia could result from factors like inadequate clothing, wet clothing, or alcohol consumption in a community setting. Toxicology tests revealed Libby had a blood alcohol level exceeding the legal driving limit. Dr. Lyle couldn't definitively conclude if hypothermia caused Libby's death but couldn't rule it out either. In relation to drowning, Dr. Lyle stressed the difficulty in confirming it as the cause of death especially without direct observation. Typical signs of drowning, such as froth or foam around the mouth and expanded lungs, were absent in Libby's case. While her lungs had a slightly crackly texture, they weren't noticeably wet or expanded. Therefore, Dr. Lau reached no definitive conclusion regarding drowning as the cause of Libby's death. Upon analyzing Libby's injuries in relation to the potential of asphyxia, specific findings emerged. There was no evidence of bleeding in the brain or skull, and the facial bones, including the horseshoe-shaped bone behind the tongue, were undamaged. Injuries like abrasions on Libby's forehead, nose, and eyelids were interpreted as consistent with post-mortem body movement and water exposure, according to Dr. Lyle. The court was presented with evidence indicating that seminal fluid cells matching Pavel's DNA profile were found in swabs taken from inside Libby's body. Witnesses close to Pavel testified during the trial, offering potentially incriminating details. One of Pavel's acquaintances mentioned that Pavel had discussed offering a girl at the bus stop a ride home, alleging that she had made advances toward him. Another colleague testified that Pavel had offered to drive a girl home, but she began behaving strangely, undressing in his car, leading Pavel to ask her to leave. Additionally, a neighbor of Pavel testified for the prosecution, claiming to have seen Pavel cleaning the mats of his car on the bitterly cold afternoon of February 1st, which was deemed unusual. In evaluating Libby's vulnerability that night, Professor Charles Deacon provided expert testimony explaining that due to alcohol consumption, Libby would likely have experienced numb hands and impaired coordination, making her unsteady on her feet and prone to fatigue. Moreover, 
her judgment, balance, and ability to fend off potential threats would have been significantly compromised, rendering her vulnerable. During the closing arguments, the prosecutor emphasized to the jurors the circumstances surrounding Libby's condition that night, intoxicated, cold, visibly distressed, and in need of assistance. The court received compelling evidence suggesting that seminal fluid cells matching Pavel's DNA profile were discovered in swabs taken from inside Libby's body. Testimonies from individuals close to Pavel during the trial provided potentially incriminating details. Witnesses testified to observing Libby in distress, crying, lying on the ground, and shivering. The prosecutor urged the jury to consider what could have occurred after Libby entered Pavel's car. Was it conceivable that in her vulnerable state, she would willingly leave the warmth of the car to lie in the cold snow and engage in consensual activity with Pavel? The prosecutor emphasized to the jury the importance of using common sense to discern between plausible scenarios and nonsensical propositions. Furthermore, the prosecutor reminded the jury of Pavel's history, highlighting that he was not a savior but rather an individual driven by his own sexual urges. In contrast, the defense argued that Pavel encountered Libby that night, offered her a ride home, and engaged in consensual activity with her. They asserted that Pavel stopped at the playing fields when she began feeling unwell, and when he left, she was still alive. The defense suggested the possibility that Libby may have taken her own life. During the trial, Pavel testified, stating that he offered Libby a lift home upon encountering her crying on the street, expressing compassion for her. Pavel described encountering Libby on Beverly Road, where she was visibly distressed, and he expressed his intention to help her. He asserted that the sexual encounter between them was consensual. The jury observed CCTV footage depicting Libby and Powell walking on Beverly Road before driving to the Oak Road playing fields. Powell admitted to driving around that night with the aim of finding a woman. He also confessed to past actions, such as stealing women's underwear and intimate items, as well as peering into windows. Powell explained that he initially concealed this information due to concerns about his marriage. According to Powell's account, he speculated that Libby might have ingested something or had her drink tampered with, given her unusual behavior. When he offered her a ride home, Libby willingly accepted his hand, and they walked to the car together. Powell noticed that she appeared more relaxed once inside the warm car. While driving, Powell claimed that Libby exhibited signs of nausea, leading him to stop near the Oak Road playing fields. He recounted how, upon halting the car, Libby attempted to depart but fell to her knees on the snowy ground, visibly distressed, according to his testimony. Powell asserted that as he drove away, he glimpsed Libby walking on the pavement, and thereafter did not encounter her again. Upon arriving home, Powell took a bath and watched a movie. However, concerned about Libby's welfare, he revisited the playing fields to ensure she was not in distress, but found no indication of her presence. Throughout the trial, revelations surfaced regarding Libby's mental health struggles. Lisa Squire, Libby's mother, disclosed in her court statement that Libby had a history of mental health challenges, including depression and an eating disorder. Despite these difficulties, Lisa emphasized Libby's lifelong fear of water and general apprehension about the dark, questioning the notion of her taking her own life. Medical records submitted as evidence confirmed Libby's battles with depression and anxiety alongside documentation of her researching suicide methods, including thoughts of jumping into a river. Even Powell's legal representatives acknowledged the seriousness of his past behaviors. However, the defense argued that there was no substantial evidence of a violent assault against Libby. Powell's attorney maintained that while Powell might have taken advantage of Libby's vulnerable state and engaged in deceptive conduct, there was insufficient evidence to support allegations of rape or murder. The defense raised the possibility that Libby may have tragically taken her own life by falling into the river. During the closing statement, the defense attorney prompted the jury to consider whether there could be plausible reasons for Powell's lies, recognizing that even innocent people may sometimes be untruthful.
while acknowledging Powell's error in judgment and leaving Libby alone while distressed, the defense proposed that Powell may have fabricated his account to shield his family. The attorney aimed to instill doubt about the prosecution's case by underscoring the lack of definitive evidence linking Powell to the alleged crimes. Following deliberation, as the jury failed to reach a unanimous decision, Judge Mrs. Justice Lambert informed them that she would accept majority verdicts of either 10 to 2 or 11 to 1. Ultimately, Powell was unanimously found guilty of rape and guilty of murder by a majority verdict of 11 to 1. After the verdict, Libby's mother, Lisa Squire, expressed the profound pain of losing her daughter. She mourned the loss of her cherished firstborn and lamented the fact that she would never have the opportunity to experience the joys of being a grandmother to Libby's children. Lisa shared the anguish of not being able to be there for Libby in her final moments, describing the challenge of living in two contrasting worlds, one where she fulfills her roles as a mother, wife, and employee, and another where she grapples with darkness and loneliness, yearning for the chance to be reunited with her daughter. Additionally, the court heard testimony from Ross, Libby's father, who found it incredibly difficult to confront images of his daughter following her tragic passing. During the sentencing proceedings, the judge directed his focus to Powell, shedding light on the unsettling evolution of his criminal behavior leading up to the tragic demise of Libby. The judge underscored Powell's increasing audacity and growing confidence in evading apprehension. Of particular alarm was Powell's brazen and persistent harassment of women, even when confronted with their discomfort. The judge firmly believed that Powell's intentions extended to concealing Libby's body expressing a fervent wish that it remain hidden indefinitely. Powell was handed a minimum sentence of 27 years for the murder, to run concurrently with an 18-year term for rape. What's your take on this story? I'd love to hear your perspective in the comments below. Your involvement and encouragement are truly appreciated. Thanks for being here and joining me on this journey. Remember to prioritize self-care and cherish the bonds you share with your loved ones.